The following interview was conducted with Carol Napoon, professional librarian in the Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Library for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, May 16, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Carolyn, welcome. Good Thank afternoon you. to you. Okay, tell us a little about where and when you were born and parents and siblings and many years. And I was born in 1946 in Rensselaer, Indiana. I was raised in Monticello. The road. <laughs> yes, but I was definitely a local person. <laughs> uh, so I went through school, um, K through 12, at in Monticello and it became Twin Lakes. When I was a senior, we were the first group to graduate from Twin Lakes after it consolidated. So um, tell us a little about high school. Did you go to grade school there too? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, tell us a little about that. Well, I had polio when I was in the first grade. So I was out for a year in rehab, and then I started again the next year. So actually I graduated a year later than the kids I started in school with. But I was kind of glad actually, because the group that I graduated with, they are so, such a cool group. So, and we all said, didn't we have a neat class? And we did, we had a really great class. So when we have reunions, we always have so much fun. And it's nice that you kept, you still kept in touch. Mm -hmm. That's good. And now high school, is, is this in Monticello? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. How has Monticello changed over? I well, I don't go there a whole lot. My no. sister lives there now. Um, yeah. But um, I think the schools have changed quite a bit. When we were going, they really emphasized um, academic stuff. And the kids that graduated with a high school diploma, there, their senior year was equivalent to the freshman year in college. That's so good. when you come to college, it was like repeat. And so I'm not sure that they're doing the same anymore. Um, what's that? Uh, I forgot. I'm drawing a blank. That we think the park is there. What's that? I mean, the park, Indiana Beach. Yeah. Was that there when you? Oh yeah. That's so. That's been there for a while. Okay. <laughs> but that's changed a lot too. Hasn't right. It, yeah. it sold last year. Two yeah, years a year, ago. two years ago. That's right. Well, in high school, were any clubs or anything that you were participated in? Um, I was in in junior high. I was in a group called Melody Maids. Um, it was a singing group. There were about a dozen girls in that. And I got to be really close to the teacher. She was really sweet and she just sort of took me under her wing. And, and then when I was in senior high, then I was in um, the choir and uh, the, the selected group from the choir called Golden Throats. And we would go around singing for Kiwanis, that kind of stuff. And I was in the band, so. What'd you play in the band? I attempted to play the clarinet. <laughs> I wouldn't say I. Played. But you stayed in the band. They kept you in. They didn't kick you right. out. Right. <laughs> yeah. But so I, I'm really, you know, I like. Okay. Being After music and high stuff. school, then what came next? What you um, do? I started working as a bookkeeper for um, Graves Bakery, which no longer exists. And then I met my future husband there, and then we got married. He's Asian, and my children are half Asian. He's from Burma. Um, you how did, did uh, was he re uh, was he born there or how did you meet him? Do, do? He was working at the bakery where part time, and I was the bookkeeper in the, okay. for the bakery, and that's where I met him. So, being so wise in the ways of the world at the age of eighteen, I got married. <laughs> Back okay. then, that's what girls did. That's right. Back then, in the sixties, girls when they got out of high school, they got married and stayed home and had kids. That so was that's a, what that you're supposed a, to do. That's right. Okay. Where did, you, then where did you live and what did you do after when you got married then? Mm, we ended up living in Lafayette most of the time or Berkston a little bit and then back to Lafayette. Um, and then it was through him then that um, his, one of his friends at work, he worked at Great Lakes, one of his friends uh, was married to a lady that worked up in the business office, I believe, here in the library and she suggested I could work for the library, so that's how I ended up getting in the library. Because I didn't start out in, in um, high school thinking, oh, I want to be a librarian. It didn't even cross my mind. I sort of fell into it. <laughs> and I just sort of like progressed from that point. Um, you know, and, and I worked with this girl in the math library. I started out in math library. Mr. Funkhauser hired me in 1970. And I had that two girls. In the math science building? Right. Okay. And I had the two girls. They were pretty young. They were like three and four at the time. Your children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So anyway, I started in the math library, and I worked with Gwen Rasmus, who was my supervisor. And she would not accept any excuse that I had to not take a class. I can't give her these excuses. Nope, that won't work. Just take one. If you don't like it, you don't have to take any more. So she forced me to take a class, so I only did it to shut her up. <laughs> and 10 years later, I had a bachelor's degree. I was divorced by that time, and I was raising my get my kids by myself. So um, it was quite you went, a struggle. You went through Purdue. You got your degree from Purdue, didn't you? Mm-hmm. How long did that take you? Ten years. Wonderful. While I was working full time and raising two kids by myself. So then, then I got the bachelor's in 1980, and and I switched after the first year. I switched from the math library over to geosciences, and Mr. Funkhauser was still my boss. Um, but the library was you still pretty in, new. Were you, you were, the civil where you're now was not, you were in the old civil building, right? We were you in were the old pharmacy building, which is called oh, Ge- Geosciences, oh. which is now Schliemann. <coughs> okay. The old part of Schliemann. Okay. So it was really a pretty neat place because the library is at the end of the hall and it overlooked the fountain. It's beautiful to be able to look out there and see that. Because if there was anything going on out there, you could see have the best view, you know. Sure. And so it was really great. And um, then after I got the bachelor's degree, then I went back and picked up teacher certification because my degree was in education with a specialty in school library AV. And I picked up the teacher certification two years later because they closed out the program and they called and said, you really need to get that. You got your, sir, uh, you got that, is that that media science program that used to, Carolyn Whiteneck? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, I remember that, yeah. In fact, I did, uh, Carolyn used to run a workshop or something in the summer and she'd have some students and, I, and that's where I really got to know her and I used to mm-hmm. help out with that workshop. And oh, that. Okay. So I, re- I remember that program and yeah. I interviewed um, somebody who knew Carolyn she was since passed on, but she was mm-hmm. well recognized in the profession, well known mm-hmm. in the state too. And I was like, like one of the very last ones to graduate in that program because they shut it down. Yeah, I know. So, anyway, so I got the certification for that, and then, then they started the um, program. Dagnesi started the program for professional librarians. They wanted one in each library, and Mr. Funkhauser came over and said. I want you to get a master's in library science. I, and I said, but I hate school. <laughs> he says, let me put it this way. <laughs> if you don't get a master's in library science, when you move to the new building, which was under construction at that time, we're going to bring in an MLS over you to be your boss. <laughs> I said, I'll think about it. <laughs> and from the time we had that conversation, which was in January, a week later, I was sitting in class. See, I didn't plan for that. I just had it forced on <laughs> me, so I went ahead and went. And because I, I called down there, they said, "Are you IUPY?" Yeah. Okay. They said, "You know, school starts in a week. If you want to start now, you can. Even though you're not officially accepted into the school, you could go ahead and register for class, and they can accept you later." So I said, "Let's get this over with." So I would take two classes a semester. I needed 13 classes. So I drove to Indianapolis, and they, back then you had to also get some of your credits at IU because the degree says IU at the end. So I think now you can get the whole thing online. I don't think you have to drive anywhere. But back then you had to. So I would count. We were, it was lucky, though, because, you know, initially they didn't have it at IUPUI. So you, some of us years ago had to go down to Bloomington. You know. Oh, so, wow. Oh, yeah. It was hard. Okay, go ahead. That's quite a drive. Yeah, it is. So I would count the number of times I'd have to drive, when I'm driving down, I'd say, X number more trips for this semester and until I have it down. That's the only way I could deal anybody, with it. Could you, co- uh, did you, were you, uh, anybody else going at the same time? Or you um, I was, Kim Garland, or Garfield, she was over in CFS. She was going at the same time. So but could you share the ride then? Or we didn't. did, but she kind of had some issues with, she was nervous, and oh, it was okay, nervous, okay. it was nerve-wracking for her to be in a car with, where she wasn't driving or something, right, so I, finally she just drove herself. Okay. So, um, I think she had anxiety, so it was actually the term. But anyway, so, but we still were in most of our classes together. It was the only way I finished that up in 20 months, and then when I was writing out my resume, Scott Brandt was my boss. And he's looking at it. He says, well, you have an error on here. 
that you got down that you finished you started here and you finished there for your master's he said that's 20 months there's no way anybody could finish a master's in 20 months especially if you're working full time and I said well I did and that's not an error <laughs> I love it that's the real thing right yep but that that uh, that last you know when I was in working on my master's I really almost never saw my kids because I was in, you know, working full time, and actually, I even picked up a part time job because the cost of gas was killing me. Oh, yeah. Dri- do all that driving, so I really didn't see my kids much. And then the very month that I graduated, my daughter graduated from Purdue. You no, know, from high school, oh. and it's like, okay, I, I've got time now for you. And they're going like, well, sorry, mom, we're out of here. We're going to college, you know. <laughs> so then I suddenly had time on my hands, and I didn't, and my kids are gone. What did they do after they graduated from, from high school? Did they? They came to Purdue. Oh, okay. So they did they finish at Purdue? Well, Karina put in four years and had a good time, but <laughs> you have to have a C average to graduate. And she had a C minus average, and she never finished. Oh, okay. But um, Missy did. She she put in like two and a half years here. Then she she went to University of Missouri in Kansas City and finished up her degree she like there. It out, did she like it out there? Yeah. Uh huh. She liked being out there and uh, you know Kansas City is really a beautiful town it has a lot of fountains and yeah, stuff, more than any other city right states. so anyway so she went out there and she finished up her degree she's now a teacher and Karina is uh, a railroad engineer for CSX she drives trains isn't that amazing because back back when we were growing up women had to do the traditional fields and if they worked they were in nursing education or a librarianship, that's, or a secretary, that's about it. So, see, I'm a librarian. So what here she's doing was traditionally a man's job, but. <laughs> that's really good, yeah. Tell us a little about how the library has changed over, uh, oh. about the move and things of that sort. It's Talk phenomenal. It. Um, of course, we started out with card catalogs and everything was manual checkouts, that type of thing, writing over dues. Um, and there was a lot more interaction with the patrons. And now, we hardly ever see the patrons. They like to come into the library to use it as a study space, but they're not really using our, you know, the the collection that much because everything's online. They're going online. They bring in their own laptops, sure. and they're going online and looking at the collections. And then they come up to us if they have a question. So it's totally, totally different than it was. And they can check out their own books too. Right, self checkout. We haven't sure. got that in ours yet. <laughs> We're not that up to speed, but um, yeah, that's next for us. Well, actually, for next for us is um, we're going to combine the libraries. We're going to be, um, the piece that libraries will be over where the old smokestack used to be, you know, between engineering and, and Humpty Hall, and that building that's falling down. That's going to be, it's going to be. In the new facility. Right, that's going to be the combined physical science and engineering technology libraries will be in there. Several years down the road. Right, about they are thinking maybe seven because it's on the plan right now. So that's you know this probably be seven. Years. Plus, life science is going to go in too. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And pharmacy, of course. Before uh-huh. it was just going to be um, physics, uh, earth atmospheric sciences, chemistry, um, and engineering. And now they're going to be taking in life science and pharmacy. So uh-huh. I think they'll just be like a tech. Vet med, hissy and undergrad, is one, and then the PSET, which is going to be called Boiler Commons. Well, it'll be Craner. Right, and the Craner. Mm-hmm. So there's a it interesting, be yeah. big difference. Because when I first started, I think there were 36 libraries or 32 or 30 uh, something. Something like 33, 32, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Joe's the one that I remember the old education library that was in the education building, and it was. It was sort of it was sort of nice and uh, psych library you know CFS is another one you know that's close right. to yeah 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 about that well and of course I think the other claim to fame is that we had so many copies of chem abstracts that uh-huh. Purdue did we used to talk about I think there were subscriptions to it I don't know twelve or something like that you know it was ama- amazing <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, changed a lot but I noticed a lot of my. I mean, and also talk about the math collection too. That 
we've right. got over there. But how well, a lot of you? my work now is involved, even like on the weekends, a professor will email and say, I can't get into such and such journal, and I need such and such article. Well, they don't know how to go in sometimes and look at the different paths to go. And so I'll go in and download it and put it on my um, desktop, then I just email it to them rather than try to direct them. Sure. Okay. Or if it could be that maybe they didn't pay the subscription, or for some reason it's not working, and I'll tell them, well, we're gonna have to wait till I get in on Monday because it's I can't get in either. So anyway, it's it's changed like that. I never would have gotten those kind of um, emails in the past or contacts in the past over sure. the weekend. But right. now, now I'm a twenty four seven librarian. They see me on the street. <laughs> I'm still their librarian. You know. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. So. And the, the faculty has grown, hasn't it, over time? Mm-hmm. For the longest time, we had 28. We have 43. That's the last I counted. Wow. That's it changes. Cool. Yeah. Um, talk about the map collection. The map collection used to be part well, of us here in Stewart Center, yeah, special but tell, collections. What, I would say tell, what the original thing and then what you got from over, was over here. Right. It was special collections, and then we had a smaller map room, which was actually the second copies that... Stewart Center would get, they'd give us the outdated copies or our second copy. So we had our own collection over in Geosciences. And when we moved to the new building, Dagnesi came over and said, we need one map room. Let's just combine them together when you move to the new building. So originally they were going to give us that much space for the map room, but after Dagnesi came over and talked to them, they decided to give us more room. So they had to change the design of the um, library and add some more to it. And you moved all the big cases over too, didn't you? What yes. was the um, the original collection of the maps? What kind of maps? Because there are other places on campus, isn't there, that have maps? Very few. And oh. what they have is there's almost nothing. We have like over 200,000 topographic maps and over 150,000 aerial photos. Um, and then our aerial photos go back in time, like every 10 years we buy a set. But we don't now because of Google Earth. You can sure. get it online right now. Right. But the old archival maps are not replaceable and they are not scanned. Probably only 10% of the collection is available online. So if they want to see how things were before with the one to, um, one to 25,000, with the top, most of the totals are back, then they need to come and look at our collection. And since they don't publish maps anymore, USGS used to publish them, and they don't anymore. Huh. So our, our old archives in particular are very valuable to us if they want to go back and look at things historically. So we have a scanner. The department provided us with a scanner, and it's 55-inch scanner. It's huge. And then the you need it because I remember right. when the ones in special collections. <laughs> yeah, they like are. Like the Earhart maps, you know. Right. So anyway, they, when they go to scan it, the file is so big that you can't like email it to yourself or anything. You have to like put it on a drive somewhere or put in, bring in a flash drive. And we have CDs that we'll give them that they can burn a CD. Um, so anyway, what we about let them do does that. Ag, does an ag have some maps or do you have, do, they have, do you have maps that agriculture can use or not? Um, do the soil of, survey type stuff yeah. is, life science has a lot of that. Oh, we they don't do. really get into that. Okay. The first... 10 inches soil. Okay. We okay. have like the county, the Tippecanoe County Soil Survey um, maps, which comes in a book. Uh, they published one like 1956 or something, and we kept pounding and pounding. They finally published one, I think, in the late 90s. Wow. And um, so we have that. But over in Life Science, they have, have them for the whole state. We don't. We have some of the old ones, and I actually asked them not to put them in the catalog because people come thinking we have the whole set, and we don't. I want them to go where the whole set was actually officially sure. stored. Okay. Yeah. So, are you planning to? Are they planning to digitize at all of these, the old ones, or? That would take a lot because you would have to have a grant to hire people to do right. that. Now we do have something in the map room which is really, really exciting and cool. We have five volumes that are so big that they take up the inside of the map drawer. It takes two people to pick up one of these books because they're like, how long is that? Three feet, probably three feet long and then maybe two feet wide. Um, they're bound together with these screws and then the maps are, are um, backed with cloth. So they're very well preserved. And they were the very first aerial photos that were ever taken 
with this technology that's a very precise technology. Um, I was telling, doc, I was telling uh, Dr. Mullins about it, and he says, can you prove that? And fortunately, with keyword searching, I was able to pull up a document from, I believe it's from the, the Annals of the American Association of American Geographers. There was an article, and he talked about using this technology, and he said the first ones were done were of Tipping New County. I, was, I thought, there it is, so I printed it out, good. and it's right there on top of those, those Yeah, that's books. good to, to, to keep it re ready reference right. so people can, you know, see it right there. That's great. And um, the interesting thing is there's five volumes, and one of them covers it's all Wabash Valley. And the reason they did the aerial photography, the very first aerial pho photography, is That's what these are, the very first? From, that were from um, the Wabash Valley. The reason they did that was because Purdue had the very first airport that was from a university. So they used that as their base to fly out and go take the aerial photos. Then they published them in these big volumes, there's five volumes to the set. We have scanned one volume, and Chris Miller, had our GIS librarian, has it on his server. I've got a link to it on our webpage. But it's just pretty exciting because nobody else has that set. But they were found in the trash at, in Louisville at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. One of the professors in civil happened to be over there, and he saw them in the trash, and he said, these belong in a library. And he said, can I have these? He said, we're done with them. We don't want them. Take them. So he bought them and bought them into the library, and it is really neat now it's only been in the last month i finally got them cataloged they are finally in the catalog because you couldn't just send the map or you couldn't send the book over to somebody to catalog because it's too big you know mm -hmm. so patty um glason yeah came over and she she says i didn't want to leave that set because it's so interesting oh yeah i bet isn't that nice yeah and dr braille asked me a couple of years ago he said does it include purdue i said I never looked. I want to go look. Is there any kind of an index to it at all? or In the front of each volume, it tells what, what pages are for. So I went, went and looked, and sure enough, they came, the pictures were high enough up and looked down, and it did have Purdue. So That's wonderful. we went That's to Purdue. Really That's a really neat thing. It is really exciting. And, you, and you're exciting to have something like that. Did you right. So when we move our facilities to the new, to the new one, when we merge with the other libraries, these volumes need to go into special collections. I would think so. Because they're unique. Oh, yeah. Nobody else has a set. Right. They're one of a kind and, and they right. need they need to be preserved. Yeah, I would think right. that's a good idea. What kind of user base? Do you get quite a few people from campus or, or what are the off campus users of the maps? For the maps we do get a lot of off campus users. A lot more in the past than we do now. Okay. Um I know people will come in that were doing like one guy would come in every summer because he's going to go on the Appalachian Trail and he would do a, a different section and he would need the maps for for that section of the trail. So he would come in there and he would just photocopy it and tape it all together just before we had the big scan. Right. <laughs> and, um, and Virginia worked in the map room and she would always have ways of getting people to talk about what they were doing and, and find all these really interesting things. Oh, and people thing. would have... The neatest stories about why they wanted maps, you know. I like maps, and I and mm -hmm. I I've always enjoy enjoy them, and yeah, they're they're just nice. When we were growing up, we had a map had a map on the wall, and we used to learn all you know. Map of the world was really oh. nice. We used to play with that a little bit, you know. I know another one that came in on a regular basis would he would um, want to get the Canada maps because he wanted what the Can Canadian maps because there's so many fishing holes up there, and he wanted to go to a different one every time. So he'd get the maps out and pick some place to, sure. to go. All right. Tell us about the GIS uh, library, and that was a new position. Yes, we hired um, a GIS librarian in 96, I think. No, I can't read that. I think you said so, oh, 2006. Oh, 2006, okay. Yeah. Got the six right. Yeah. Uh, Chris Miller. He is so busy, and he works with Larry Theller, who's the, uh, the head on campus for the, he is in charge of the um, site license. Purdue has a site license just by um, some software by ESRI, E-S-R-I, which stands for something. And it, they have the, uh, it's called ArcView and Arc this and Arc that. But that is GIS software. They're the biggest publishers of software for uh, geographic information systems. 
and Purdue has a site license. So anybody connected with Purdue can get a download of these different software things, which are quite expensive if you want to download it as a person. But since you are connected with Purdue, you can you can download these things mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. What are uh, do what's a, his user base? What people does he does he work uh, uh, people on campus? Yes, pretty much. Okay. He pretty much does, and he teaches some classes in it too. Okay. So I asked him. I said, "Do you teach any like 101 classes? Because that's where I would want to start with GIS." And he said, "Not really. I'm I'm in a higher level than introductory." Yeah. Have you ever have you done some teaching while you've been here? The classes yes, there? I I teach. Um, there's usually two or three classes uh, that I teach each semester. Mostly it, lately, it was, I've been working with Dr. Philly in a 100 level class, and um, what what we teach the kids is how to pull up information off the internet and how to tell if it's any good or not. And it means That's mainly, a big thing. They have to look at about us and have to check out these sites to see whether or not they're valid because there's so much junk out there and so we would have them pull up these sites and then they would have to write a paper at the end and and they would need some journal articles and they need some internet articles and so we'd show them how to find all these different sources and how to tell whether or not they were valid sources to use. The yeah, evaluation is really a big thing in right. being able to do that and isn't the most ones that pop up on top are the most relevant. <laughs> right and I got a kick out because one time each small group they work at small groups each group would have to pick a website that they were going to use for their paper and they would have to verify why it's good and we had a list of questions of what what they should look for and they'd have to fill in the answers then they'd have to trade with the ones that were on the other side of the aisle and then they would sort of they would look up that website and they would tell whether or not it was valid or not. Well, I know this one kid, I said, you, you might want to rethink whether or not you want to use that website. He used it anyway. <laughs> he went up there, and it very plainly said under About Us that it was a communist site. And I said, I think they have an agenda. You might want to look at a different source. But no, he, I, he, this is what he wanted. And he's got, <laughs> so I got, I got a kick out. And I enjoyed working with kids because like they appreciate working. anything you do for them. And our department, too. We have the best department on campus, and I'm not saying that just to be nice, because when they had my retirement um, reception a few weeks ago, and I said that to them, I told them how much I appreciated working with the best department on campus, and because they're geologists and they're atmospheric scientists, and meteorologists, these people are different than regular Purdue. Mm -hmm. Faculty. Yeah. They are outdoorsy people. They go out on field trips, they're traipsing around in mountains and everything else, and mapping or whatever else they're doing, getting seismic fault zones, <laughs> all that stuff. And they they are just excuse the pun, but they're down to earth. They really are. And afterwards, Mr. Funkhauser came up at the reception. He says, "You know, you're right. I have worked with all the different engineering fields. I've worked with physics. I've worked with mathematicians, and he named one other." chemistry and he says you are right the EAS group is the best one to work with they're very very outgoing because that's their their cup of tea yeah, yeah that's yeah. right how about committees what you were on quite a few committees in the library huh well yes I really can't remember too much well I've done a lot of DigiRef work right worked with them on that um is DigiRef used a lot by your people in the EAS, do you think? Do they use it? I think so, because sometimes I've taken the questions from them. I said, if you sure. come downstairs to my yeah. office, I can answer this easy. If you come look at the screen with me, and, oh, are you? I didn't know it was you. <laughs> I'll be right there, right? <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. So they come on down. Or I've looked over other questions that some people have answered just because I wanted to know, well, if I get that question, how would I answer it, you know? And I've seen that maybe... I could have answered it a little more thoroughly because it covers my area a little right. bit and they didn't ask me. So I'll send an addendum and say, well, you really need to check this, right. this, and this. That's good. So, Because I, I just didn't want them to feel like they got shortchanged. Right. When we did online searching, you had, we had somebody, we used to use the American Geological, the uh, ge geo Geological or Geoscience Abstracts or something like that. Wasn't there a publication um, like that? GeoRef? GeoRef. That, yeah, right. We used GeoRef. Uh, GeoRef was used some, but not a whole lot. You know? <laughs> well, that's our main source. But now with ProQuest, it's awesome because it covers that and several sure, fields right. all at once. So now I'm telling everybody, skip GRF and go straight to ProQuest because it'll cover if there's something in another field that right. 
process over you with also it. went to some national meetings didn't you yeah I go every year to the Geological Society of America annual meetings and then I'm in the Geoscience Information Society which is basically geology librarians and we have very unique collection development issues so then we have our own technical sessions and that type of thing so we I learned so much from them because they are on the forefront and then if there are things that are not maybe like the cataloging isn't correct for the uh, U.S. Geological Survey or something, they will go to USGS and say, you need to add this and this, and then they do it. I'm going, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> because they actually have, and it's a small group, there's only about 100, and then about 50 of them show up. But they have enough pool that they can get things changed. So and I'm pretty see impressed. The yeah, that's pretty nice. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's a small group, but very dynamic. Yeah, well, they work. It's a nice, cohesive thing, sort of thing. Right. Too. Uh, let's see. Um, were you ever a faculty fellow in any of the residence halls? No. You know, it's a faculty fellow program. No. Uh, well, you talked about family. Uh, any awards, honors? Any? Well, I the Geo, GeoNet moderator, listserv moderator, for this group I'm in, GSIS. And they gave me an award for that because I've been it for a hundred years. Well, okay, twelve years. <laughs> that's nice. But that's really was that kind of a surprise? Mm, right. Okay, <laughs> that's kind of good. Uh, what in the professional associations you mentioned? Uh, you still still a member? Right. You're going to keep your membership up. You belong to ALA? No, because yeah. I, I had to pick one. I know. And I picked the one that's for geology that's libraries. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Boy, your space has really changed over time. But your uh, your collection, is it going more towards E? Do you think? Uh, yes. Except, like, a lot of the books, we still, they want to have their hands on a book. Um, so there's one publisher, the Geological Society of London. They wanted us to buy this collection. Um, so we, all the <laughs> geology librarians got together and we said, we want the collection, but we want the special papers that are special publications that go with it. We want to imprint and electronic. And they were trying to just sell us in electronic. But our we know our people want their hands on a book. Yeah. And so we said, well, we'll buy it if you also get it, let it include those publications in print. And they had to redo their <laughs> yeah. their contract and said, okay, we will sell you the, the books included in this. So we get both the electronic and yeah, for some of those things, you really need the hard copy. You want to look at it and spend a little bit of time with it, right? Now, when you came, um, Mr. Dagnese was the director, right? No, there wasn't one. It was a search. Always before he came then. Right. Because he came in, that's right, he came in 72. Right. And so then you've been with, and then Emily and, uh, and Jim. That's pretty good. And actually, I don't know if you are aware, but there was, there was one guy that came in, he was here one day, and he, like, took a look at this mess, and he said, I'm out of here. <laughs> what, for a director, John? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Candidate. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, so it's actually one they don't talk about. <laughs> well, when uh, Mr. Moriarty was, in those days, when he was the director when I came, and in those days, uh, you could get, if you were going to retire, you could get a, a uh, final leave or something like that. I forget what the termination leave or something, which was really like a sabbatical. And, oh. and so he took, because he retired in June, but they had, but he was gone from January to June. And then, unfortunately, the following March, he had a heart attack. He was out doing polling or, or, re or registering people for voting, and he had a heart attack. So oh. he didn't last too long. He was a nice person. Yeah. My daughter used to date his son, the grandson. Oh. So I know who you're I talking think about. One of the sons. Mark is on the faculty over in Craner School, I think. Well, this one, um, this son is a teacher. Oh, okay. He's a teacher over at Benton they School. Had three, they had a daughter and two two boys, as I right. recall. And then his wife remarried afterwards, but she's since passed away, and so was, you know, he. How about a Purdue tradition? Can come to mind? Yes. I, I wrote this down so okay. I wouldn't forget. Okay. <laughs> um, my Purdue tradition is backing the Purdue Boilermakers to a national championship, which hasn't happened yet, but I'm not giving up. I feel like a Cubbies fan. <laughs> well, look how long it took us to get from Roseville 1 to Roseville 2, so, you know, <laughs> faith. Uh, how about an outstanding event? Well, there's a few you here. Have, you can have more than one. I have to tell okay. them, they always say, can it be one? I said, no. 
Do you remember when President Reagan came? Eight, 1987. That was so exciting, and we went to the arena, and they, we had to go in early because they had to check everybody, make sure they didn't have any weapons on. And, and then we had to sit there for a long time. Finally, he comes in, and the people stood for at least 20 minutes, clapping their hands, and I had chills the whole time. I've never had 20 minutes where I had my arms were just like chills. And I clapped so much that my hands were sore. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. It was just awesome. And I, my kids were in school at the time, and they they didn't get into the arena, but they were on the um, airport road, and they got to see him drive by in the limo. Isn't that nice? That was so I was I was awesome. There. It was so great. Yeah. That was my favorite memory mm-hmm. of Purdue. Let's see. Another thing, um, I spearheaded a 90th birthday party for Professor Gordon Prescott. And was he, he on the faculty here? in our department oh, okay. for a long time okay. and he had no clue it was a surprise birthday party and we invited like his neighbors and they say well you should invite so and so so we had his, all his neighbors and friends there were 55 of us that showed up out at university and and um, we had dinner a lunch for him and he he's like never would use any foul language he always was everything's up and up very athletic person wonderful Anyway, he came in there, and he was so shocked to see what was going on. And he gets up the microphone, and he says, how the hell did you pull this off? <laughs> we just Isn't got the great? biggest kick out That's of it. That's all you needed was that. <laughs> so that, that was really fun. And then on the 6th of this month, we had my retirement reception, and it was for the department and the libraries. And that was just wonderful, beyond words. Um, Dr. Hines, um, kind of like, what do you call it when you don't fry somebody, what do you call it? He roasted me. He roasted me. (laughs) And it was just really cute, you know. So I got to sit up there and get roasted. And then Michael, my boss, said a few things. And and Mr. Funkhauser came and surprised me because he said he was going to make it, but he was. And he just wanted to surprise me. He came and he got up and said a few things. Good. And some of the other professors did. So. Were your children there? No, because oh. Missy's in Costa Rica. Oh. And Trina's out on train trips. Who knows how long <laughs> she's going to be gone? But um, my sister and her husband came, so okay. now we had a nice turnout for that. Uh, and there's one other thing. The reception for Drew is named actually pronounced Foistel, the astronaut. That was just really neat, too. That's nice. Very good. How about post-Purdue? What are your plans? Well, I would like to take one cruise in particular. I would like to go on an Alaskan cruise with my daughter and her husband. I just think that would be really great. While I'm still physically a little bit able to be right. mobile, right. I would like to go on that cruise. Um, I buy books twice as fast as I get them read, and I love to sit in my backyard in the swing reading in the sun. So I'm going to be reading a lot. Also, I like to donate some time to my church serving others. And my brother had um, a stroke a month ago, and he's doing pretty good, um, but we don't know if he's going to need a lot more care uh, once he gets out of the hospital. He's in a rehab right now. But if he needs 24-hour care, I would like for him to just come and live with me. Is he married? Does he have family? Uh, he, he was living with his daughter. Oh. He's divorced. Okay. And in Indiana? Noblesville. Where? Noblesville. Okay. okay. So, you know, until he gets back on his feet enough that, you know, if he wants to go back and live with Chrissy, fine. But she said she was worried when it first happened. She says, what if, what if when he gets out he needs 24-7 care? I can't do that. I might have to put him in a nursing home and then my aunts are going to be mad at me. And um, I told her mom, I said, you, you tell her that I will take him because I have the space and I'll have the time I'm retiring and I don't want my brother ending up in a nursing home for the rest of his life. Yeah, that would be so, nice. We'll hope. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Anything that I forgot to uh, ask or anything additional you want to add? Well, let Some me notes? see if I covered okay. anything here. Something I forgot. Hmm. For the longest time, we had the only movable shelves besides, we had the only movable public access shelves when we moved into the library. Then VetMed, they they got it a few years ago. 
And when we moved into the new library, um, there were a lot of things that happened that the um, architect didn't quite design it right, like he didn't have the ceiling high enough because you have to have the sprinkler system come down. It has to be a certain amount of feet of clearance before you run into the shelves. And as it was, the shelves were running right into the sprinkler system, so they had to raise the, the ceiling. There were several things like that that went wrong because they didn't design it right. They really need to talk to the librarians before they design these things. So I wrote a paper on it, actually, and the title is Relocating a Science Library, How to Cope with Plans Gone Awry. And I listed all the things that they did wrong and how they did fix it. And then I found out when they did the vet men, they did the same thing. I said, they should have read my paper. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't do a lit check, you know. Like, they shouldn't. All right, yeah. All right. So, anyway, I have I have a list of my papers here. If you want to, that would be good. I'll be pleased to. Caroline, I want to thank you very much. It's been really great working with you all oh, these years. Thank it's you. It's wonderful, and I wish you the very best. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>